I started doing whatever I had to do, whether it was automating something or doing manual work, you know. I, I would build the nicest Tableau dashboard and somebody come up to people have come up to me who have been like very non technical. They're like, Hey, how do we can we can you print this out for me like on a piece of paper? And on my head I'm like, Well, you're not gonna like the whole point of a Tableau dashboard it's is interactive. To be interactive. Yeah, exactly. But I all I I just remember that about painting is so I was like, Here you go, brother. <laughs> like I'll print it out like in every single tab laminate I'll print it out separately for you or lay it out on the table and and it worked because when you solve people's problems they see it they appreciate it you don't come out as cocky as a cocky like technical person but it led to me being promoted the first time within like nine months and afterwards I got promoted again and I got promoted again Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Antonio Ivanovsky. Antonio is a proud husband and father of two beautiful children. He's also a senior data analyst at Google, where he helps protect Google's ad ecosystem from invalid traffic. Antonio has also had experience as an AI project manager and a business intelligence analyst at Verizon. Now, if Antonio is not working, he is spending time with his family, playing sports, or investing in crypto. We have a lot of interesting topics on the episode today, first being how a single person, a professor, had a profound impact on Antonio's career. We also touch on how his career priorities changed once he started to have a family. I think it's a really interesting concept to think about is how our priorities and our mindset changes when we start to have kids. Finally, we touch on how Antonio organizes around his hobbies and why he has specific hobbies to fulfill specific needs in his life. I really enjoyed this conversation and I hope you will as well. Antonio, welcome to the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ken. I think we've been talking about this for a while, so we finally made it happen. Yes, it is a long time coming. You know, obviously... Uh, we, we met a long time ago and I think it was Harpreet's happy hours that, that he was doing. Yeah. Those were some, some good times, COVID good times. times. <laughs> yeah. But I'm happy it could culminate into an interesting conversation, conversation between the two of us now. Um, something I like to do to get the guests, I mean, well, the, the audience familiar with any of the new guests is I'd love to hear about your first experience with data. So did you get interested in it because of a singular experience or was it more of a slow progression over time? Yeah, so goes back to my college days. Um, started off as an undeclared student. I was always good in school, but didn't know kind of, you know, like they kind of make you go through a certain path in college and commit to something. I was like, okay, well, that's a big commitment you're asking me to do, you know. So I decided to try out different things. You know, I was good in math, but I like I didn't really like want to be a teacher. Um, you know, I didn't know what other things are possible. I tried accounting, didn't really en enjoy it. I mean, I I was good at it, but again, I like this. I don't see myself doing this for a long time. So I had ended up taking a a seminar like find your passion and. It was like I wrote down my passions, right? I was into sports. I loved going to like music festivals at the time, loved traveling, you know, as like most 18, 19 year olds. And when I did that, I look into like my paper, my answer, and it, there was a sports events and tourism marketing major at my university of Montclair State here in New Jersey. I'm like, all right, this is perfect, right? Those are all the things that. I that I want to do and um, I signed up to it they had like some internship at Disney all immediately I signed up to go do it get my deposit and everything so like six months from when I signed up to this major I was supposed to be off to to Disney for my internship well in the semester I was taking a technology and business general class there was a professor, Professor Mamunov. I mean, that guy just changed the trajectory of my life, who was teaching a general class. And in it, he wanted to introduce us to SQL. Um, I had skipped some classes just to travel. And 
he had given us a SQL assignment. So I had no idea what that was. I just Googled it, you know, like figured it out online. And when I went back to class, he calls me into his office. He's like, all right, who did you copy from? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean who did I copy from? No one. He's like, well, not only are you the only one. Oh, well, there's only two people in the whole class who got an A. You're the only one who got 100. And he's like, you missed my last two like uh, classes for this. I was like, I don't know, man. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't copy anyone. It didn't seem too bad. I just Googled it, you know. And he's like, well, what's your major? And he's like very direct, like straight up Russian guy, you know, um, stereotypical. <laughs> and, um, he was very, he's very successful. So he's like, what's your major? And I'm like sports events and tourism. You know, I'm telling him about how I'm excited to go to Disney for my internship. And he's like, well, what's your internship? And then I'm like, well, I'm going to be working at a cafe, you know, like weighing tables and stuff. And uh, he just looked at me. How much are you getting paid at the time? It was probably like seven twenty-five an hour or something. And he says, he's like, sit down next to me. He opens up Indeed on the side. He types in the word analytics, goes on the side. He's like, what's the minimum salary there so you can filter by? I'm like $60,000. So we do the math and it's whatever between 20 and $30 an hour. As per, I think it's like, it was around like $30 an hour. And he's like, okay. He's like, here, what I'm going to tell you. You're good at this. Um, sign up to do data analytics. Um, make your money. And he's like, one day you're going to be married. You're going to have kids. You're going to take your wife and kids and do Disney the proper way. So instead of, slaving away working at Disney for $7 an hour. Just make your money in analytics, go, and uh, you're going to take your family one day, one day there. And me being lost at 18 of kind of what I want to do, I see this guy who's successful in front of me. Just say, what the hell, you know, like he had multiple, built multiple companies. Like he was out of, um, like he built one of the first recommendation systems where he ended up selling it to like a company before people even knew what a recommendation system was. Right. And so I was like, who the heck am I to go against him? And I said, uh, are you gonna, are you gonna give me a job? Like if I do this analytics thing, he's like, well, you have to go to the career center and stuff. Da, da, da. I'm like, no, are you going to give me, you're telling me to switch. Are you going to give me, are you going to help me get a job? Uh, if I switch to your, this major and, he just looked at me. He's like, this guy's probably crazy. And so he just like shakes his hand. He puts out his hand and I just shake his hand. I'm like, all right, let's do this. You know? So I just went like totally trusted the guy, um, went all into this. And uh, I say I pretty, I'm very happy with the outcome so far. I, I yeah, love so that's the a counter long... offer. <laughs> Give me a job. <laughs> hey, it never yeah. hurts if you don't ask, right? You never know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> He didn't have to give me a job because by the time I graduated, I had an internship at UPS uh, doing data fraud analytics. And so when I went back to him, he was like, all right, you seem to be set. So I was very happy. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, you know, something I, I think a lot of people don't realize when they're pursuing a passion like you almost did with the Disney internship and the entertainment yeah. and tourism is that the work in that job isn't necessarily what the field is. So if right. you're if you're working at Disney, you're not participating and observing and experiencing Disney. You get to see all the bad sides. It almost can sour a lot of these things for you. A, a lot yeah. of the times people grow up, they want to work in sports, they want to do all these things and then you know, they're washing laundry, they're doing stuff that is not desirable in in any sense and not related to their passion for the sport. They don't get to watch it. They're exactly. stuck in the back room. They're stuck doing all these other things. And so I, I think it's the advice he gave you is very compelling is one, it, you know, you're good at it. Pursue things right. that you have strength in or, or that you have capacity for. But two, you also probably started to enjoy it after a while. We tend to like things that we're good at or we have aptitude for. So, yeah, when you when you start, yeah, that was 100 percent. When you're good at it, you're understanding it, you're making progress, you're working on projects, you start liking it. And I think what I like about data analytic, data science, whatever you want to call it, is it applies to so many domains. So then I started using data 
towards sports, you know, to figure things out like that. So then I was still doing the sports stuff that I loved, but I was looking at it from the side that I actually enjoyed. And that's what I enjoy about data is it's like you can apply it to anything. Yeah, it's a multi-purpose tool that you you in theory, you could go work in entertainment or sports or any of these places too, but right. frankly, make us slightly more comfortable living than, than waiting exactly. tables or uh, one of our other guests. I think it was, uh, um, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm blanking on his name, but he, he, he did the Disney internship and he was the captain of one of the boats and it did not seem like okay. a very, <laughs> very great job, but he ended up moving into data, data engineering. And I, I think he would agree that you probably made a good a good decision going down this route earlier rather than later. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I just cut, talked to a couple of people and they say some of them were like, yeah, you're going to work so much that you never actually get to go to Disney, even though you have free access to the parks technically, you know? So once you, once my euphoria, cause I'm a person who like, when something comes up, I'm like, all right, I got to do this, you know? And I, sometimes like, I don't think it through too much, but when you start kind of step back and you actually realize you're like, yeah, maybe there is something to that. And, I think the cool part and where I knew this paid off. So I was at UPS afterwards. I went to Verizon. I was doing risk management there. And me and a couple of my coworkers, we end up getting sent to a conference for risk management. And I look on the invite for the conference. It was being held at the Dolphin and Swan Resort in Walt Disney World, Florida. And that was like, full circle for me because I ended up going to Disney. My, that was my first time ever. I could bring, so my wife was, I think she was my fiance at that time. She came with me and basically my hotel room was paid for, my parks to the access was paid for, my travel was paid for. So I emailed my professor right away. I'm like, hey, just went to Disney and it was totally paid by a company. <laughs> oh my goodness, I love and that. Just like, I told you so. <laughs> That is the perfect full circle moment, in in my opinion. And you know, the cool thing is, it still continues to to potentially get better and improve and compound as as you go here. This episode of Kenzeris Neighbors is brought to you by Z by HP. HP's high compute workstation grade line of products and solutions. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions, and I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z8 workstation. I really love that the Z workstations can come standard with Linux or WSL2 and they can be configured with the Data Science Software Stack Manager. With the Software Stack Manager, you can get right to the work of doing data science on day one without the overhead of having to completely reconfigure your new machine. Now back to our show. I'm interested, you you worked at UPS, you worked at Verizon. How did your career evolve after that experience with the professor? What went into those experiences, getting the internship, working at Verizon? What, what was sort of the career ramblings that went on up till your point yeah. working at Google now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when I was looking to graduate, right, I just wanted an internship. And that's what I tell a lot of people that reach out to me. It's like, hey, Antonio, I want to work for Meta. I want to work for Amazon. I want to work for, I don't know, the New York Giants, whoever you want to go to. And it's like, they're looking for their first job. I'm like, just get a job anywhere. <laughs> Honest. And that was my goal. I'm like, I just need a job because I noticed that getting through the door as your first job with no experience, you are basically, I don't know, you're, you're begging. I was begging for a job, basically, anybody who would take me because I had nothing to back it up other than some school projects that were good, you know. But, you know, when you're competing against some people with like three years of experience, five years of experience, maybe master's degrees, and you're just an undergraduate, it sometimes it doesn't mean you should... You know, if you want to work at Google, doesn't mean you have to go straight to Google, right? So I found a recruiter who happened to go to my school, was a couple, a little bit older than me, and he worked at UPS. And when I talked to him, he said, hey, we have an internship at UPS. I was like, I had no idea what UPS does corporate, right? I was like, okay, I know they bring my packages to the door, but I couldn't even possibly imagine like that there was like a corporate career I could pursue there. and. Um, Ended up being put on a fraud analytics team where we were doing some data analytics for predicting like which packages when they get rerouted, if they're stolen or not. Um, but at that point, I was just trying to basically wrap my head around um, 
how everything works. So I definitely wasn't doing machine learning or anything, but I was just happy to get my foot in the door. And at that time, UPS was, I mean, I think it still is a Fortune 50 company. And for me, that was a win because now if I wanted to go to another company, at least I had something to put on my resume, right? It was, it's better to see Antonio worked at UPS for some time and then applied to to Google rather than Antonio straight from university tried to get into Google or somewhere else, um, if that makes sense. So it was basically, they, they hired me, so I just went yeah. there. <laughs> well, I mean, it makes a ton of sense if your goal is to go, you know, again, work with the the New York Giants, work at Meta or work at Google. What value do you bring to them as a right. just out of school versus having the work experience? The work experience, you get it, you've at least seen how other places have done it. Some of these organizations can benefit from the best practices you've learned at other places, or you're working with them and you know, let's say, uh, you know, the uh, UPS is a client of Google and you can right. start to, you, you have inside knowledge about how they work to be able to to serve their accounts better or whatever it might be. There, there's, there's these connections and added value that you get from working that you simply cannot have access to as a student. And just getting some hooks in being able to build either skills or specific knowledge is unbelievably useful in, in anything that we do, just whether it's... Uh, our career or our hobbies, whatever it might be. Yeah. I mean, when I was just in school, I remember doing some sequel and it would be like 10 records and you know, you're doing your little joins and stuff and you're like, oh, okay, this is not bad. And then when I went to UPS and they pull out a database and there's like thousands of tables and stuff and like just the different schema names and everything is an acronym. And I mean, honestly, it took me because I told them on my interview, I know sequel because that's what I was taught at university. And then when I went there, I didn't even know how to find the table I was looking for. You know, it was, it. I think, SQL Server. I had never used it to that point. I didn't even know there were so many different kinds of SQL uh, like uh, software, right? And you're just like, you know, like, okay, I guess I don't know anything. Like, teach me what I need to know. So the first couple months was definitely like, how do I just access these tables? <laughs> and that is, I, I now I know it's totally okay, you know? I think that served me to ask questions. Don't be afraid to to look like a fool, right? Like if you try to be smart and you know, like oh, I know everything, I think you're gonna suffer. So I was I was never afraid to ask questions, and I think that's definitely kind of just got the feel for it, and definitely made me feel more comfortable being a professional, right? Yeah, well, just a piece I of remember, paper of a degree. Yeah, yeah. The, well, the piece of paper of the degree. I, I remember the first big shock that I had when I came into a real data science job is I wrote a a SQL query and it was in an actual company database that has dramatically more records than I'd ever experienced before. And I I assume, I can't remember the exact details, but I think I used a bunch of sub queries and it made the, the, what I wrote unbelievably inefficient and took like 12 hours to run. And I, from that I determined, oh my goodness, there's, efficiency things that I have to consider. That's not something you ever considered at school. You're you're just thinking right. about how do I get this to run and on this database with a thousand rows it worked fine. But when I'm looking at two million rows, it, it's not going to perform in the same way. And if I want this to be useful in my work at all, I have to think about the efficiency of the query and look at the the like the the um oh my goodness what are they called the o log uh <laughs> o of n or the or, uh, oh yeah, yeah i mean blanking on what they're called but the the amount of time or uh that, that it takes to, to run some of these things yeah. or the efficiency of some of the, the algorithms are approaching and it, it's hard i mean i'm not blaming the professor right it's hard to put that kind of stuff into uh actual curriculum um but definitely somebody should have set the expectations yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, th- that's also the thing that I think about a lot is what is the responsibility of the schools, of the education? If you're if you're taking students fra- who know nothing, are you really responsible for giving them the nuance that they may or may not use? It would help some students, but it might completely alienate some of the other students that are just only barely understanding the concepts. And that's probably a fundamental failing of how education is structured now is that we put this one size fit all approach to, onto students and say, hey, you're all learning at the same speed. You all have to do the exact same thing. And 
the people that are most ahead, probably how you were in your SQL class, they get hurt because the class isn't moving fast enough yeah. to keep them stimulated. And then the people on the other end are just completely left behind and they feel stupid and don't feel like they can do it and and they lose out on on a lot of the potential learning. And so there's probably a better way to do it, but I, I don't think most university settings or traditional classes, not necessarily to their fault, can't structure it in a, in a super effective yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, once I think that's once AI starts teaching all of us and it can tailor the curriculum to every single individual, uh, I think that's the only way to solve it. Because, I mean, yeah, like the professor, I don't know, sometimes you know even there's like 100 students for you to tailor tailor each curriculum to every single student, you know, you're going to have to be working 24 seven. It's like trying to figure out everybody's style. And, you know, in university, you have like three months, you have three months with a person and you probably never see them again. So definitely like some professors, like by the end of the semester, don't even know your name yet, let alone like your learning style. So um, the one thing though, I didn't, I think coming out was very different was, and I think they tried to bring students in with the programs and stuff, but I thought that, everything I was going to be doing was this cool machine learning because everything there was machine learning, machine learning, you know, and like predicting, like even the first one, Titanic, if you're going to survive or not, it's like, you know, like cool stuff. And I remember going into work and <clears throat> I'm like, all right, I'm going to be, I'm on machine learning, you know, like, you know, I know the algorithms, I know how to set it up. And the director had asked of me, something with like in some Excel database and me just being, that's like kind of what I studied. So I tried, I'm doing like machine learning on let's say, I don't know, like three, 400 records, maybe even less. And it takes me a week to build this algorithm, put it out. And I go to him and he's like, where have you been? I'm like, well, I was building a model. He's like, for what? You could have just done like a simple aggregation in, in Excel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the table. You even need SQL for that. You could have literally just done a pivot table. And he's like, I just went and did it myself, but I didn't want to say anything to you. You know, I was like, he's like, I didn't even bother. I thought you forgot or something. And <laughs> that was kind of the moment where I was like, all right, like these people here don't care about machine learning. They don't care about AI. They don't care about anything. What they care about is bringing value to the company. Um, so whether you did it in Excel, whether you do it in SQL, whether you did the most advanced AI system, <clears throat> as long as you solve the problem, that is all that matters. And I think that's that moment that switched me from like this naive student who I believed that was going to be a big shot doing machine learning and data to just 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 bring value. And I ended up with just that. I mean, there was one person older and he's like dude he's like if you want to succeed if they ask you to pick up a if they want this like wall to be purple just pick up a brush and start painting don't tell them about your degree or your fancy your sequel just pick up a brush and start painting the wall you know uh, <laughs> and it, it really is true like i started doing whatever i had to do whether it was automating something or doing manual work you know i mean i've done stuff that I, I would build the nicest Tableau dashboard and somebody come up to people have come up to me who have been like very non-technical. They're like, Hey, how do we, can we, can you print this out for me? And like on a piece of paper and on my head, I'm like, well, you're not going to like the whole point of a Tableau dashboard it's is interactive. interactive. Yeah, exactly. But I all I, I just remember that about painting. Is I was like, here you go, brother. <laughs> like I'll print it out. Like in, Every single tab I'll it. print it out separately for you or lay it out on the table. And and it worked because when you solve people's problems, they see it, they appreciate it. You don't come out as cocky, as a cocky, like technical person, uh, which a lot of us, I know we do. And even, I, I mean, I've been there too, where we think we're like kind of better than the Excel. <laughs> um, but it led to me being promoted the first time within like nine months and afterwards I got promoted again and I got promoted again and it was just, and I hadn't touched like machine learning. Probably I had done like one machine learning project. Everything else was whatever else the company needed me to do. Um, so that was when I turned and that kind of switched to like, okay, now I figured out the, the real world. <laughs> 
So where did where is the like line drawn between giving someone fish and teaching them to fish? Because to me, there's I think what, I agree a hundred percent. Where you, you want to create value, you want to be able to build these things, but inherently, sometimes longer term value is created when they're starting to use dashboards correctly, or once right. they they have the insight about oh, this is this is how analytics could be used and how valuable it could be. Where does that start to change? Is it as you go up and you're having more authority to be able to educate? Or is there always some of that element of just like, man, here's the, here's, here's the paper. Yeah. It's, I think it's when you build trust, when you start as a new analyst, like if people don't know you, right, you just come in and I think, I, I mean, it's still there. I think it will be there, especially with AI as well, getting more advanced is when you come more technical than others. There's always that fear. Is this person going to automate my job, right? So I was technically a Verizon. This was a Verizon that I was speaking a lot of. It was it was a BI person and dealt with automation and dealt with kind of like making and dashboards, things like that. It's always like the financial analyst that we support. It would be like, well, if this person, is this person going to automate my job? Am I going to be out of a job? You know, so people get scared and naturally kind of tend to lock up. Because if I come to you and you're doing... Like there was this person who was doing, like it was taking her 20 hours to do some financial statements, whatever it was. And I looked at it and it was a repetitive weekly process. So I said, hey, I can auto, like first time I solved it for her, right? Like just kind of wrote some sheets and stuff in Excel, helped her out with that. And she's like, okay. So I said, I can automate this for you now because she's starting to trust me a little bit, right? We're getting to know each other. And I'm like, I can get this down to like 15 minutes. For you instead of like the two weeks that it's taking you and at first you know it was kind of like well if you solve this for me in 20 minutes then my manager is going to see me that i don't have anything to do for the next two weeks right and that's just natural human reaction well just starting to build up that trust it was like well if i can solve this for you which you hate right you don't like doing this you can do other stuff that you actually enjoy so when I took it off her hands, I ended up automating it. And then now it's, it gave the person more time to do things she enjoys. She's like, oh, well, what about if I work on this project? You know, now I don't have to spend two weeks on this. And what about that? And so the first time, you know, you kind of have to slowly ease into it, show them the value of it, show them how it can be beneficial. And you start slowly building them up for that. I mean, by the end, we were there. We were teaching people. Like, you know, once we they saw the power of these tools, they're like, hey, well, I know I asked you to pull data for me, but is there a way I can pull the data myself? And now you're like, all right, now we can go into the stuff we want to teach him, you know? So then we started holding like trainings about simple SQL stuff, you know? Hey, if I, I know you want this data, sometimes it's going to take me three days just because I have other projects I'm working on. But if you do this simple, like five line SQL, you can pull this data yourself and you don't need me for this. So like, all right, that sounds pretty good, you know. So over the time, we ended up building it out, and a lot of the people were ended up doing a lot of the things themselves. And then we were there just for like the more complex issues that existed. I I could not have thought of a possibly better answer explanation than what you just gave there. I, I think that <laughs> the the idea that a lot of a lot of data people, a lot of technical people are a little too proud to just do the sort of grunt work to get things off the ground yeah. and to build that trust, they're missing out on real adoption and people genuinely being interested in what they're doing because it seems like magic. And if you right. can produce the reports, if you can do those easy things and it's easy for you, people start to think maybe that would be easy for me or maybe it could be yeah. done better or I want to learn about this rather than, oh, it's just this black box that produces these things. And also if they like you, if you're genuinely nice right. to them, they're going to be more inquisitive and be open to hearing new things from you. And I, I, that, that to me is something that is a, a missing step in a lot of people's career success is because they're thinking about how it should be rather than what it is and what they need to do to get buy-in or get people to where you want, where they, where they want them to go. Uh, yeah. And when people start liking, you know, they come to me afterwards, they're like, Hey, Antonio, I know. I have the, now I have, I have, you solved this for me and I have this other problem. I don't know if you guys can do this, but is there a way to like, you know, like X, Y, and Z? And most of the time he's like, like, oh, why don't you just say so, you know? But 
you know, it's very probably easy. it's probably very easy for us to do. Yeah, exactly. But you know, they were never willing to open up, or they didn't know what the possibilities are. You know, so when you take the time to build that foundation, more opportunities come up, and that's why I always say it's very important to kind of be kind. I think that's always and people people to like you because I think if you're the smartest person in the world, but if you're off putting and people don't want to come to you, you're not you're not going to get very far. Yeah, I think that there is more and more now. It's the myth of the isolated, grumpy senior developer, where yeah. <laughs> where maybe I think it used to be that there there were definitely people that could fundamentally code or knew a system or all of these things better than other people. And they created a mode around themselves because of that. But now in a world where most companies have dramatically better documentation, where most companies are evolving in terms of the tools they use, the resources that are out there, Stack Overflow, ChatGPT, any of these types of things, the moat that these individual people have is getting dramatically, is drying up effectively. Uh, because right. the knowledge mode is shrinking, whereas for better or for worse, the interpersonal skills and the and the community aspect is is becoming more relevant. Uh, it, that's a very weird singular use case where AI is actually making us have to be more human. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So tell me a little bit about the transition into Google. What was that experience like? What what prompted a move like that in your career? Sure. Yeah. So I was started my career as kind of doing the data analysis, you know, like um, person, BI. And then I wanted to go into a little bit, try into product management because I was seeing when I'm, I was the analyst, I, I can do the work but it was somebody else dictating to me kind of from higher up management dictating to me what should be worked on. And they had the direction of the project. So I said, okay, like I want to have more influence of what I want to like to be worked on, you know? So I ended up getting like um, a a position as a manager. And so um, AI product manager, and I started doing that. And it was, it was, it was good, right? I was working on projects where I was, we were trying to put together like an enterprise uh, data and bring together a lot of sources of data. I was working with like 20 data engineers, data scientists, architects, all in the same project. And it was good until COVID hit because all the work moved remotely and when I found myself as a product manager trying to manage the project with so many people remotely, it was always constantly on, on calls. When I was in the office, you bring everybody into the room, they talk it out amongst themselves, you know, like when you hear it and everybody's kind of happy. Well, when everybody was remote, it was very, you're just trying to reach people and then try to connect people. And at that time, my wife ended up getting pregnant with her first child. And I said, okay, well, I don't want to be, I'm going to be a dad and I'm going to be on calls all day. So I wanted a job where it doesn't matter if I do my work at 6 a.m., at 6 p.m., whatever. You know, I still have some meetings that I have to join, obviously. But otherwise, it's it's pretty flexible when I can do my data analysis and, you know, just being the individual contributor. <clears throat> um, so I. I said, okay, this product management thing right now, at this point in my life, it's not for me. So I just want to go back into the corner and just code my 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 stuff. And I started looking. Um, I wasn't trying to necessarily get into Google. At Google, you have like three times you can apply in a month to three positions. So I just would always do my standard three applications, you know, month after month, never expected anything, never got anything back in return. and then. Within one week when I I applied, Google ended up reaching out to me like based on my application. And at the same time, a recruiter had also found me through LinkedIn because I was very active on LinkedIn. So within a week, I ended up getting two Google interviews with two different departments. And honestly, to this day, I don't know which one I got just because it's all a blur. So I don't know if the recruiter that reached out to me for this position or is the one I applied to. 
but I ended up switching to Google because it was, well, yeah, it was a going back down to like senior data analyst. And at that time I was remote for two years, um, 40% pay increase plus all the bonuses and stuff. So I was like, all right, let's, let's do this. You know, I think, um, I wasn't concerned. A lot of people were like, well, why would you step down from being like manager to like analyst? I was like, well, you're, if you're looking at it from a position, maybe it's stepping down. But when you're looking at it from a salary, it's stepping a lot up. <laughs> so I definitely didn't care about that. I'll, you just give me more money. If you want to call me like a data analytics intern, I wouldn't really care. You know? <laughs> if you're just giving me more money, you can call me whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah. You, we talked a little bit offline about how your the stages of life that you're in can really dictate what type of career you're interested in. And right. I would imagine things changed when you had your first child. Can you talk a little bit about maybe what you were looking for before that, even, you know, when you, it was just you and your wife or even just you and you were single versus what you look for when you have a family? Because yeah, those life changes can really have a massive impact on the career changes that, that we approach as well. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, me and my wife, then, let's say, girlfriend, fiance, we were living together. They say, like, what is it? Dual income, Dinks, no kids. No kids. Yeah. Dinks, yeah. So, it's like the life, you know, both making bank, you don't have responsibilities, you know. And we're like, you know, if you get a job, they ask me to, like, you used to wait for them to ask you to travel. Like, when Verizon would <coughs> say, go to Georgia, I was, like, calling my wife, like, honey, they, let, they say I can travel. You know, I got this nice hotel room, you know, on the weekend, you're going to come, we're going to chill. Like we went to Florida and then she got sent to Florida for her job. And it was like, every time we got called, it was like a free trip, you know, like it doesn't matter when they called you, if they told you, you know, it's like you were, you were happy, you know, and that was kind of <clears throat> what the mental game of it is right now. If I'm not supposed to go into the office and I live like an hour away. And they say, hey, Antonio, you need to come to the office today. It's like, hey, honey, like they need me to go to the office for one day, you know? <laughs> like, so that person, as soon as I had my, I held my son, it was just like the, the switch flipped. All of a sudden, it was like totally end of the spectrum where I didn't want to travel. I didn't want to have to work past five o'clock, you know? I mean, when I say that, like every once in a while, right? If you have a project you need to finish up, obviously I'm not really, oh, I can't do this, but I didn't want it to be a daily thing. So I started looking for where's the work-life balance good, you know, which Google has. I mean, I think it's a misconception. Like when you go to these big companies, you're not going to have a life. I mean, do your research. But basically when I read Google had the uh, work-life balance, um, I didn't have too many meetings, which again, like I knew that I was going to probably need it. Like in the middle of my working day, like, Hey, the baby's out of control. Like come help, you know, so I wanted to have that option too. So, um, it definitely, I think changes the way I've looked at my career and even from a bigger thing. I mean, I've had like, I like, I'm into crypto. Uh, I like AI and stuff and I constantly have ideas about how, I could make a product or I could do consulting, right? I charge money for people, but I always go back to it. How is this going to affect my family, right? Like, I don't want to work till five at Google and then afterwards go in, even though it's extra money. Like, no money can be exchanged for being there with my with my family. Um, so definitely... You know, you it, it's it, sometimes it's hard, you know, because you could potentially be leaving a lot of money on the table. But I think you have to set a limit for yourself and just say, like, I'm not doing this, you know, uh, unless I mean, if somebody offers you, you know, like a million dollars to do a speech somewhere, which I mean, definitely hasn't happened to me. But if somebody does, like, you can make an exception, you know. But for me, like, if somebody was to offer me like a fifty thousand dollar raise or uh, right now to to go to another job where I would have to travel for it, I wouldn't definitely wouldn't do it. Um, I think it sounds like, it seems like that's something that, that really 
uh, one of the biggest things that changes like your value of money versus time uh, yeah. versus quality time and the amount of money that it takes for you to sacrifice quality time is dramatically higher once you have a family versus when you're on your own or when you're in that dink situation and yeah you know, that's something eventually I'm excited about experiencing in the short term I um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have to figure out my own stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, when when you give up something, right? I don't like right now. I'm happy where position I'm at, right? I just want to do my job, go home. I'm I don't have the same ambitions I had, like climb the ladder very fast. And like you said, it everything is has its time and place. Because okay, my kids are right now two and like seven months. And they're they're always they're home. Um, in a couple of years, my son is going to start school, and let's say my daughter, let's say in four years. Well, once these kids are in school and they're gone from at least nine to three, maybe even longer, you know, then you still could start pursuing more things, right? You can pursue more opportunities. So, I'm not viewing my career pause, like my career ambitions, as oh, that's it, it's over. I'm just putting them on pause for, let's say, four or five years. And then I can still do the stuff that I want to do. Um, right. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Uh, right. Just because you're pausing now doesn't mean like, all right, my life is over. Right. I'm totally giving up on this because one day my kids are going to have friends. They're going to want to do their own thing. And then, you know, I'm uh, then I can start resuming the things that I, I wanted to do, you know. Um, so. It just it's just patience. Some of your kids might yeah. like the same things that you do in, in recreation yeah. or business or any of these types of things too. And it's like, well, you'd be happy that you either paused a little bit or you just put something on the back burner to be able to share an experience like that with them, which is awesome. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm using AI right now to create like a short stories for my son. Well, we actually, I have the short stories written and they have been told by me. So I'm using it to generate art for it. Because I'm a very bad drawer, so AI has really enabled me to kind of make good art. And so that's kind of, I'm still staying on top of the stuff that I love doing. I'm just using it for different purposes. Like we said at the beginning, like data AI is so encompassing that you're just shifting what you're using it for. <laughs> yeah. Well, you talked a little bit about, you know, like making art for your kids, talked about crypto, talking about some of your hobbies. You had a really cool philosophy on hobbies that I'd love you to share, if you don't mind. I, I thought it was pretty, yeah. pretty um, compelling. So basically, um, I found myself getting overwhelmed. Again, this is like I had a child and I wanted to do crypto. And then AI comes out and, you know, now you're like, oh, my God, I'm missing out this boat. And you want to keep up with Python for your job. And, you know, everybody seems to be making money during that 2021, like crypto bull run. They were like, holy crap, I need to do this, you know. And I found like I was doing podcasting. I was doing uh, part of like Discord groups where I was coordinating projects, trying to make up for it. And uh, it just, I think, burns you. It burns you out. But it also, you st you know a little bit about a lot of things, but I didn't get good enough at anything and ended up like making, I didn't make money at anything, you know, cause you just dabbled all over the place. And then you're like, okay, just every project turned mediocre. Um, so I, I had, I found this saying, I like listening to like Tim Ferriss podcast, uh, Derek Sivers, if you know Derek Sivers, uh, he is like a philosopher now former business person who like has the greatest quotes of everything and greatest story so i just listened to him and um, basically is have have three hobbies right one to make you money uh for me that's crypto right now um one to keep you creative that's kind of like my ai stuff that i'm doing and the drawings and the art i'm doing for my son and one to keep you like physically active and that's that's um that's working out for me like and working out for me comes first because in order for me to be able in a state of mind to do everything else i need to kind of like work out and just keep myself physically fit and physically and mentally fit um yeah so that's kind of been my thing because i realize you can't do it all um, well 
So on that note, so where Derek Sivers comes in, it, so there was a donkey, right? He tells the story of a donkey. On the left side, you have hay, a bucket of hay. On the right side, you have a bucket of water. And the donkey, like, oh, I'm hungry. Let me go for the hay. We're like, oh, no, I'm thirsty. Let me go for the water. And keeps switching back and forth. And it couldn't decide which one to go for first. The donkey ends up being ends up dying. And basically, the point of the story is the donkey could have had the water and the hay if it was patient enough, right? So you can do it all, just not all at once. And where I am with my family, with my career, everything we've been talking about is I can reach all my ambitions, just not all at once. So now I'm focusing on, like I said, working out, family time, and crypto. And then, you know, I have the next 60 years to do all the other stuff that I want to do. Well, that, that, reminds me, <laughs> that reminds me of one of my favorite books, which is called The One Thing. And it, that was a huge paradigm shift for me is that essentially, unlike, well, just like computers, right? Parallelization, unless you're using different cores, is kind of a myth, right? We're just stacking right. things over and over again on, on the same core and they're processing it sort of uh, like in, in batches rather than just like focusing on one thing or, or, or truly paralyzing. Like humans are terrible at multitasking. Right. And that yeah. includes multitasking across multiple projects and different things that we're doing. And so we actually get a lot further if we spend our time focusing and building one thing until that thing has what I deem critical mass or momentum so that it can carry on in itself. And most of the time... Right. We don't build these things up until they have the proper amount of momentum before we start something else. But that momentum from one thing can carry you into the next thing. So there's a, a good example of dominoes. And so if you stack up, I think it's 20 dominoes and each doubles in size, the 20th domino is essentially the height from the earth to the moon. Oh, and wow. I mean, obviously the power of compounding yeah, yeah. returns, but the idea is even more specific. It's that... If we do these things sequentially and each of these sequential things that we do has a compounding effect, we get dramatically further than if we start four things at the same time and they don't get those compounding returns from those other things. I mean, think about um, like a, a content creator, right? Is if I, if I get to the place where I have 100,000 uh, loyal subscribers that really like the things that I'm doing, anything that I would do beyond that I have the momentum of the engine right. of content or any of these other things that, that people can feed into. Uh, and, and to me, that's something that we usually give up before we have the momentum and the critical mass. I know that I, like, I personally, with some of the projects, even including the YouTube stuff that I do, I, I believe I probably let, thing, let my foot off the gas before I truly reach momentum and critical mass. And you know, at the end of the day, that's a, a lesson that, that I've learned. But at the same time, that's something that I can carry on into these other things that I pursue is, okay, am I, have I reached the point where I can work on something else or should I still be working on this thing to get it just a little further to be able for it for, to be self-sustaining? And to me, that's something that is very easy to overlook because the last 10% to get it to self-sustaining is usually... Uh, the hardest or we feel like we've made it already or whatever it might be. And that's that, at least for me, that's a huge lesson that's perfectly described in the, in the donkey story as well. Yeah. Because I mean, I think in it's social media makes it harder, you know, like, I mean, with content creation specifically, you know, you're, if you start from zero, there's 10, you get 10 views, you know, and you open up YouTube and everybody's getting, it seems like everybody's getting a million views and, everybody's making money off of everything and then you're just there and you're like, Oh, three people share my thing. And you know, it's very easy to get, <laughs> to get them motivated or, you know, I try, like I would make content and make stories and people like, Oh, we like it. And then I'm like, okay, like put a, I put out an email link and be like, Hey, you know, if you like this, why don't you share it with your friends, you know, and then nobody shares it, you know, and then, you know, you've written like 20, 30 newsletter editions and you, you there's like, you grow by like one subscriber and it's, it's very easy to get demoralized, especially when there's so many new shiny objects out there. Um, but I think what you have to do is 
I think you have to have a thesis as they say in crypto, like write down why you started this, right? What it means to you. Like I, I like to put stuff like I, I will paste it on my laptop or somewhere where every time I see on the computer, I can see why I'm doing that. Like kind of like what, what got me to start in that project. And you have to ignore everything else. I mean, it's so tough. It's so tough. I mean, especially now, even like with content creation, with crypto, with me is I have my project I've invested in. And every time I open up Twitter, there's a new shiny thing that's going to hundred X and based on the best things I've met, the best traders I've met is sometimes it's just, just sit on your hands and do nothing. Those are the most successful people. Like just stick to what you know and just let it happen, man. Just let, like you say, let compound interest do the work for you. Because if you're starting always from scratch, then compound interest is not working for you at all. And it, you're not going to, in the, in the long term, you're actually losing. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's like a perfect example from Charlie Munger or Warren Buffett. Yeah, they spend most of their time with a ton of cash sitting around. And when the opportunities come that are rare, but well, once every year, once every couple of years, they're prepared to be able to capitalize on it because they've done all the research. They can identify the good opportunities. They have done the homework to be able to reward and patience is so important in that. And well, it's I, not, I also, it's not yeah. only that when you said, sorry to cut you off on this one, but with Warren Buffett, people say, well, he's the best investor. And I read this in the psychology of money. He goes, Warren Buffett, when you say he's the best investor, it's not because he made the most returns year over year, right? There have been people who have outperformed Warren Buffett by three or four or five times. And an but Warren year. Buffett has done it for the longest, right? There's people who maybe outpaid, do it more than him, but maybe they retired after 10 years. You know, they switched to something else or they didn't want to do this or their returns got worse over that. Warren Buffett has been, I think he started investing, I don't know, don't quote me on the age, but like 10 or 13. And then he had the, he has the gift of living till in his 90s or whatever. Yeah. So he's had 80 years to make those returns where somebody else did it for 10. And that's kind of what pushes me with everything that I do. I'm like, I'm looking at everything and trying to, I'm like, I have 70, 80 years. If I can just stay in the game, you're going to be better than 99.9% .9 of the people because most people are going to quit. Like you said, what is that? Or like 70% of podcasts never make it past like episode one or episode five, whatever that is. It's like very low numbers. So just staying consistent is just going to make you win. And yeah. well, it's, I think the formula is there, but doing it is the hard part. I completely agree. And I think that there's another angle too. And from, from, I love the founders podcast. We've talked about this before, but he studied Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett, an extensive amount and, and a lot of different entrepreneurs that have been successful. But something that really stood out to me is that diversification is actually a bit of a myth. The idea that like us, where you're working on all these different projects and effectively not doing them all to their potential is not, doesn't really take you anywhere. If you make a ton of investments that are poorly informed, you're probably not going to return well, even though you've technically diversified. If you right. complete, let's say I know NVIDIA unbelievably well, I've, I've studied them. I look at the market. I've looked at the past scenarios. I've looked at all these things. If I were to invest only in them, like where I, I'd done all my due diligence and all my homework, that that would be a good investment. I'm not saying this is an investment. I'm not saying this yeah, is good yeah. investment advice, but <laughs> that would arguably be better for me in the long term because I have unique knowledge about that that other people don't. If I spend all of my time focusing on YouTube or any of these types of things and I'm truly focusing on mastering that craft, I'm probably going to make more returns on that than if I worked across four or five different social media platforms because I wouldn't have mastery over all of them. Like right. what, what separates people and ideas and companies is that you've mastered the domain or you've gone and done things that other people were not willing to do. You've created this moat and that moat comes from like disciplined pursuit of craft or from building something out or from doing things or having ideas that other people don't have uh, and sticking to it like singularly. Right. I think Andrew Carnegie said, put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket carefully. And yeah, it's cold. <laughs> yeah exactly. And to, and to me that, 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 that's something that's become very obvious 
in my own shortcomings of trying to do too many things, trying to focus on a lot of stuff. And it, it, it's, it's pretty easy to see that if, you know, if you're really focusing and dedicating time to something, you, you can create those differences. It's not hard. I mean, it's not easy. It, it takes a lot of time and effort, but once you break through to a certain stage, you, you start recognizing things and, and, uh, and having opportunities that you didn't believe were possible. Right. And I think to take that to the next level, and I think this is, I mean, different philosophies, right, is a lot of people think when they start something like that, they have to go all in. And I have friends who want to go into YouTube, right? And like, well, I've learned that you should go all into this. So I quit my job and now I'm full-time YouTuber, you know, and okay, maybe things don't go your way for six months a year. Do you have enough money to stay afloat, right, to cover that? Are you going to start stressing over money and how you're going to pay your bills? Well, that's going to make you more likely to quit. I know it might push you. Like some people are like, oh, I had on my garage. I slept on the garage floor and I'm now there's the billion dollar company there. But that's a, such a small percentage of the population. And I think also other things play into it, right? And also you're probably not a genius. Like, oh, Bill Gates dropped out of college and look at how far he made it. Um, so my personal philosophy and is why is like even with my crypto stuff that I love doing, I keep my full-time job. That's going to bring me a steady income, especially when I have a family now. And I'm going to take what I can invest. I'm going to learn. I'm going to put money on the side. If I have to, once my kids go to sleep, I hang out with my wife. After she goes to sleep, I do my crypto for like an hour or two, right? And at one point, may, I might be giving up on something in the short term. But in the long term, I think I feel a lot more comfortable because if tomorrow I go invest and the price of my my investment is kind of like goes down 10%, which is at 20%, which in crypto is very normal, I don't have to panic because I know that I'm not in any financial risk. I'm playing what I can afford to lose. And I can afford to wait for Bitcoin to go up in three years, right? I don't need Bitcoin to go up tomorrow to pay my bill. So that's why I kind of like want to, I keep my full-time job and do these things on the side, right? You don't have to go in immediately. If things start, well, I mean, somehow picking up, right? And I'm like 10 xing in my investments. And now I don't need any more money. I don't need a full-time job. Then it, like like your content creation is going and you're making both low money of that. Then I'm like, okay, now we can reconsider quitting. But until then, I like to kind of take the more secure route and do it as a side thing initially and then see what it can, it can build up to because then I can stay in the game longer if things don't go my way, you know, like I'm not going to, I'm not going to panic if, if it takes longer than it, and it always takes longer, you know, if you think you're going to make it in a month, it's probably going to be at least a year or so. So plan accordingly. Well, I, I forget what the idiom is, but it basically things take like a lot less happens in a year than you think will, but a lot more happens in five years than you think will just the yeah. way that we view time. And I agree. I think it can work both ways. Like some people burn the boats and are successful. I don't right. have the risk tolerance to do that either. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I still work a you know, almost full-time job and do the content business and these types of things. And to me, you also get the benefit of learning from different domains <clears throat> is that there are things that I can apply for my work and relationships that I have there that cross over to content or to telling good stories or any of these types of things and, and life experience that I get. And so if we're viewing it as, oh, you know, working at, at, at Google, having a, a, a data analytics job, it actually might help you with your crypto stuff in some way oh, yeah, because sure. you're, you're learning these skills. You're talking to smart people who might be interested in the same domain. I think the idea that you know, like the, the burning the boats, some people need that. I don't think right. most people should approach it that way because you also forget that Money is a massive catalyst for growth in any business or any side hustle yeah. or anything that you do, right? So it's going to cost you, know, if, you money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you either need you need three things, in my opinion, to start or to be successful in business. You either need you need financing, you need know how or knowledge base, or you need time. And I think with two of those yeah. things, you can have a successful business. But right. if you don't have time and know how to begin with. Quitting your job is really not going to do a whole a lot. Right, for you, right? <laughs> exactly.
Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that th- that's sort of my guide map for for approaching those things. But Antonio, this was this is awesome. These are all the the questions I had. Do you have any final thoughts, final words of advice before we uh, end it here? No, man. I mean, thank you for thank you for inviting me. I'm really glad. I know uh, once we almost met in New York in person. So maybe next time you're in New York, we can definitely can definitely do that. Um, but it was really great talking to you here. Thank you. And um, I mean, just people, just like you said, be know who you are. Uh, like self awareness. If I could put on a billboard, as Tim Ferriss said, you know, just be like, just slow down and like take the time to really know who you are, because then you can kind of make decisions, right? Don't follow the crowd that on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, or whatever. Just stay true to yourself. Amazing, I love it. And then, how can people learn more about you? What you're working on? Things along those lines. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Antonio Ivanovsky. Uh, we can put the name in the description, and um, that's probably the best place. Yeah, perfect. I'll put it in the show notes in the description as well. Antonio, again, this is awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks again.